Hello and welcome to another episode of Dark Souls Dissected. In my most recent episode, we looked at the spatial relationships between different areas and how accurately the game conveys them. We'll be doing a little bit more of that again towards the end of this follow-up video, but the main focus today will actually be on out-of-bounds content. I wanted to showcase what sorts of artifacts, misplaced objects, and weird odds and ends can be found hiding behind the walls. Join me in my ongoing journey to help bring clarity to the world of Dark Souls. Perhaps the most notorious misplaced item in the entire Soulsborne franchise is the floating door in the Duke's archives. It can be seen floating off in the distance when you first exit the prison area. Teleporting up to it reveals that it's not attached to anything and you can't interact with it. This is by no means a unique observation, but I think I actually know where it comes from. All evidence points to it being a misplaced piece of map from the prison. You'll find similar doors throughout the interior of the prison, so it becomes a question of, are there any spots with missing doors? And the answer is yeah, there's several actually. There's a really oddly large one up top, so ignoring that one, there are three candidates for where this door could have been placed. I'll talk more about these rooms in a moment, but first, there's something else we can do to help corroborate the door's original placement. We find that it's not an actual object file like the rest of the doors. Instead, it's a fixed piece of the map, like any other segment of wall or floor. We can toggle different segments of the map from rendering, and in toggling the door from displaying, we see that it doesn't disappear by itself. Map piece 2204, which includes this door, is actually the interior of the prison. And it's not just any part of the prison, but specifically it's this upper section that houses the three rooms that I pointed out. So now we have a very good idea about this door, and how it's really just a misplaced or improperly discarded asset from this area. But we're not quite done here. What are these rooms? The first one in the upper right is the one that you can drop down to after climbing the ladder, which contains the Maiden set. But the other two rooms are weird little pieces of Out of Bounds content in and of themselves. Let's take a closer look at the one that's above and to the left of the bonfire room. It's a small room with nothing in it and no connecting paths but it does have collision. Now, most of the time, when you go out of bounds in Dark Souls, it's very unlikely that you'll find collision of any kind. Though there's a few exceptions of weird places you can wind up, you'll usually find that out-of-reach areas only exist visually and you can't actually stand on them. So as unremarkable as this little room looks on its own, it's actually one of the very few proper, unused rooms in the game. And if you could somehow wind up in there, you could simply walk out and drop down onto the main staircase. Now, the other room, located opposite of the ladder that exits the prison, is a little more interesting. It also has collision, it's a little bit bigger, and this one actually has a vertical shaft that drops down into another cell. It's the cell containing the large soul of a brave warrior. Not many players will think to look up while standing there, but you can see a little bit of the vertical shaft leading to the unused room above you. Here's another perspective looking at the collision map. Why are there two unused rooms here? We can only speculate, though I think the best guess is that they're simply leftovers. There are other places in this area where you can drop down to to wind up in other cells, and maybe they weren't sure how many of these places they originally needed. They might have put in a few extra rooms just in case, and perhaps there would have been more scaffolding that could have led to them. It's not particularly interesting speculation, but it's always healthy to apply Occam's Razor. It does get a little more interesting when you consider the connection to Rhea, though. The room that you can get to contains Rhea's set, and that has a drop-down path. The inaccessible room with the other drop-down path? That's actually also where you find Rhea when she's gone hollow. So you have these two drop-down rooms, and they both relate to her. These extra rooms might have been put here with Rhea's questline in mind, and then perhaps it was simplified and they didn't wind up needing all of them. Diving further into completely unfounded speculation, since I'm trying to think of any possible use for these rooms at all, I've also floated the idea that they could have been intended as spawn locations for invaders. The prison area of the Duke's archives is a bit unique in how multiplayer is disabled for it. You can't get invaded while you're inside or drop summon signs. 
But what sets it apart from most other offline locations is that you can still go there while you're online. It doesn't get blocked off with fog gates, so you can still PvP in there. As long as you get invaded outside the prison, then you both walk back inside. So because of the prison's sort of quasi-offline status, it makes me wonder if at some point multiplayer was considered for it. After all, you wouldn't need a connecting path to this room if it was simply meant as an entrance for an invader. If we want to keep going down this rabbit hole, when you first escape the prison, this is when the level recognizes that Seath is the boss and that multiplayer can happen again. But this also glitches out your counter for the humanity drop mechanic. So there is some weirdness to how multiplayer gets toggled here, which I talk about in the humanity drop video. This was probably a surprising number of tangents to go down, but I hope this helps contextualize the floating door of the Duke's archives a little more. When you pair the door with the existence of a couple unused rooms and being met with a glitch when you escape the prison, I think these things together indicate a lack of polish in the late game's development. Near the Black Knight in the Undead Burg, you can find a doorway that's been boarded over. Hiding just beyond this is an actual working door. It's one that you could interact with if you were able to get close enough. We either have to clip into the wall a bit in order to reach it, or we can move the object towards us in order to see it. Normally when we see blocked off paths, I don't think they indicate cut content or developmental dead ends necessarily. They help add a sense of scale and age to an area. That there's more to the area than you can see, it's just not all accessible to us. However, this doorway in the Undead Burg is unique in having an actual door behind it, which makes it a little bit more interesting. If we clip behind the wall, we can see that there's nothing back there. But that doesn't mean that something couldn't fit back there. If we consider the placement of this room, that leaves us with a whole potential area underneath the tower with the crossbow hollow. That would be a fairly cramped area, but you could always put a ladder or staircase that takes you further below, and then you could fit a lot more stuff down there. More interestingly, we have the exterior of what appears to be a room of some kind. Going into it shows how close it is to the unused door, which makes me think that a little hallway leading to a small room here might have been considered. As modding gets more advanced and alterations to the environment continue, I think this could be a good place to add a few extra rooms. A lot of players have observed getting 400 souls on their way into the Great Hollow, seemingly at random. Observant players recognize that this was the same number of souls that the Basilisks dropped, resulting in some speculation that there was perhaps some poor pathing or buggy AI, causing one of the Basilisks to aggro early and fall to its death. The reality is a bit sillier than that, and also clarifies why the free souls are so consistent. There's actually just another basilisk that we never get to see normally that's placed out of bounds entirely. Its starting location is not far from the entrance room with the chest and the illusory walls. Without any solid ground beneath it, it's just guaranteed to fall to its death every time. Here we can actually see its starting location since I disabled its gravity to keep it safe. Misplaced enemies seems to be a recurring issue, at least in the earlier Souls games. I have no idea what the development process looks like, but I imagine it's not too difficult to not notice when an extra copy of an enemy winds up out of bounds. Demon Souls has a couple examples that I found. There's a misplaced Black Phantom depraved one in 5-1 that will also always fall to its death. Then there's also a misplaced skeleton in the Shrine of Storms 4-1. But this skeleton is actually safe from harm forever uh, because apparently their resting position is immune to gravity. But back to the Basilisk. There's a couple things about it that I wasn't previously aware of. I'd noticed before that you only get the souls when entering the Great Hollow. This was a little confusing to me because resting at the bonfire alone isn't sufficient for respawning the basilisk and getting another 400 souls. Additionally, simply going back up the ladder, if getting closer is what's needed to make the basilisk spawn, that doesn't net you the souls either. The timing of the souls reward somehow seems to always link up with entering the level and approaching the bonfire. What's happening is that the Basilisk doesn't load in right away when you're at the bonfire. It does require going back up the ladder. But what happens is that when it spawns in, instead of directly falling to its death, it falls until it de-renders, before it has a chance to die, at which point it puts the Basilisk into a sort of stasis, and it just kind of forgets about it for the moment. Going back down the ladder once again puts you in proximity of the Basilisk, where it starts rendering again and then continues to finish the last stretch of its deadly fall. This is why the direction of motion in or out of the level matters, because you need to follow the basilisk downwards to assist in completing its fall. 
So something else that surprised me is that this basilisk actually has company. There's another one not too far away that's also out of bounds. I think at some point years ago I noticed its enemy ID, but I wasn't seeing it rendering or causing resulting souls, so I think I just forgot about it and didn't look closer. But he's there alright, apparently the soulmate of the other out of bounds basilisk. And it follows a similar required motion, just on a larger scale. Its initial spawning occurs when you approach the base of the ladder, requiring some backtracking from the bonfire, if that's where you last spawned or arrested. This one also gets too far away from us, requiring us to reach the very bottom ground level before it finishes its deadly fall. So this explains why the second basilisk was so much harder to notice. Though it basically suffers the same problem as the first basilisk, the souls from the first basilisk were a lot easier to notice, due to resting at the bonfire kind of screwing things up for the second basilisk. But if you know what to look for, you can see that it's been hiding in plain sight all along. I died here was... <clears throat> I got fucking... Stuck in a corner! Stuck in a corner! Let's take a look at some out-of-bounds cutscene content. It's not uncommon for games to hide things needed for a cutscene somewhere nearby, that way it's easy to load all the assets immediately as they're needed, instead of perhaps having to wait through another loading screen. The first time I observed something like this was in Return to Castle Wolfenstein, where I was surprised to find that clipping underground beneath a boss's room revealed an airplane in an open sky, a set piece needed for when you clear the level. Mother hand eagle's nest, mother hand eagle's nest, come in eagle's nest. This is eagle's nest, we read your mother hand. What is your status? In Dark Souls, you can find a rat stored underneath the starting cell in the Undead Asylum. But it's not an actual enemy model, it's instead an object file. To get a closer look, we can alter its Y coordinate to lift it into the cell. It's what's used in the opening cutscene. This also explains why the smallest rats in the depths can't be killed, or things like the crows for that matter because they're not actual enemy models with things like hit points, they're simply animated object files. Disabling the map and taking a closer look shows how the small rats of the depths disappear entirely from view after running away from the player. A more interesting set of cutscene items are the map pieces that can be found out of bounds in the kiln. When you place the Lord Vessel, you can see the yellow fog gates clear from the Tomb of the Giants, the Duke's Archives, and the Demon Ruins. Instead of loading actual content from different levels, it's using copies of the set pieces that are placed nearby. Though you won't find them simply running around out of bounds, because the game is smart enough to toggle off their rendering, they only render during the cutscene. Using the No Clip website instead of messing around in-game allows us to more easily browse the kiln's map with all the pieces turned on. Flying through the map in this direction would take us to where the Tomb of the Giants set piece is stored. In the sky above the kiln, we would find the Duke's Archives entrance. A considerably large portion of the Duke's cliffside area is included, even though we only see a close-up of the doorway here. And somewhere near, directly underground here, lies the Demon Ruins map piece. But what if we did want to see these map pieces in-game? How does that work? Well, in Dark Souls, how the game decides to render certain pieces of map is based on what piece of collision you're standing on. This is why if you travel far enough with gravity disabled and not touching the ground, the map won't update correctly. So to get these visuals to appear during the cutscene, there are actually several out-of-bounds platforms outside the first room of the kiln. Standing on each of these invisible platforms gets the different map pieces to load. I'm not 100% sure how it works behind the scenes, but it's as if during the cutscene, you're not actually where you appear during the cutscene, you're actually standing on one of these platforms. Now, I just mentioned that these are normally invisible in-game, but using a patch for debug created by Horcrux, we can visualize collision data in-game. We can't see them all at once, but they'll pop into view as we step onto them. First, we start with Firelink Shrine. Then we have the Tomb of the Giants map piece appear. Then stepping over here makes the Duke's Archives appear, followed by the Demon Ruins. Then over here we have the Abyss.
And here we have the entrance to the kiln, presumably for the ending cutscene. So this all means that we should be able to find this technique in other areas that also require cutscene content from distant areas. For example, when you ascend the Bell of Awakening, you'll find that Sen's fortress in the distance doesn't have enough detail to make the cutscene work. However, we can find another invisible platform not far from the bell, and this updates the visuals correctly. Taking a closer look down here reveals that we still can't see some objects that are required for the cutscene. Those are actually found out of bounds far, far below the map. Now over in the catacombs, we have another cutscene item, sort of. There's an extra copy of Pinwheel's table found somewhere below Pinwheel's room. But it's not actually used in the cutscene, there's another object file already in the room for that. This out of bounds table belongs to an alternate, unused cutscene for entering Pinwheel's room. Let's watch that cutscene in full. Did you spot it? There's a moment where you can see both tables at once, where the out of bounds one is set further back and is more poorly lit. Hidden in New Londo Ruins is another lever to the floodgates. Just like the pinwheel table, you might be wondering why that's needed for a cutscene when the lever is already there where it's supposed to be. This is because it's not the same lever. Have you ever noticed how the ladder to the red tearstone ring is tied around some weird structure? Well, astute observers will have noticed how that thing is the same as the base of the lever on the other side. So this is meant to be a removed lever, and finding it hidden nearby explains exactly what they did with it. But this is also a segment talking about cutscene content, which if you weren't already familiar, there's an unused cutscene for opening the floodgates from the outside. I find it interesting that draining New London Ruins from the outside was even considered at some point, and removing it makes perfect sense. Anyways, I will have a little bit more to say about this area a bit later. Here's a simple one. Below the floor near Vamos is a set of loose rocks, which I believe are used in his cutscene when he smashes the wall open. Be gone with you. You spoil my focus. And lastly, let's take a quick look at the Gwendolyn boss fight. It's widely recognized that if you run down the hallway for a very, very long time, that you'll eventually find an end to it. It's not actually infinite. But when the fight is over, you find that the normal hallway is actually pretty short. What the game is doing is, during the cutscene, it masks that it's actually teleporting you to another location. There's a long, duplicate version of the hallway that the game simply moves you to, instead of dynamically altering the map or anything like that. The duplicate version of the hallway is found just below the normal version. We can also go out of bounds to get a fresh perspective on a few enemies. I showed a little bit of this before, but I wanted to show Cecil's death jump from a few more angles. Because of the limited perspective when you're crammed in this corner of the arena, a lot of players don't fully understand the easy kill method. The reason he dies in a few hits from here is because he's no longer on solid ground. He jumped off the cliff of lava below to get here, and now he's holding on. You're finishing him off by breaking his grip and dropping him off the cliff. 
The game could have maybe done a better job of articulating this if he was animated to fall further before the rapid death fade and victory achieved text pops up, uh, which makes it harder to understand that it's supposed to be a fall that kills him. Here's what it looks like from a couple more angles. Because of his size, I do wish that he didn't just disappear entirely on death. I mean, perhaps that's the best way to handle a death animation, but it would have been cool if it triggered a sort of set piece of his skeleton based on where he fell. As you approach the lower entrance to Lost Isolith, it's this corner here. Here's a demonstration of me surviving the fall, uh, with cheats on, of course. I suppose this is pretty off topic, but I like when optional things can change the environment in a video game. Anyways, back on track. Disabling the map during the Four Kings boss fight reveals a fifth king below the floor, and that's whose health bar you see during the fight. The Four Kings up above that you actually fight act as damage conduits of sorts, and drain the health of the Out of Bounds king as their health drains too. As for the additional kings that spawn into the arena, there's not actually a 6th or 7th copy of the king that gets pulled in or anything quite like that. There's only the 4 up above and the 1 below. It's just that the 4 above are all capable of respawning and getting their health back. To achieve this, it's using a generator system, the same thing used to respawn mosquitoes in Blighttown. If you want to know more about how this system can be gamed to encounter a drastically different number of kings than expected, uh, I highly recommend Limit Breaker's deep dive into this. A few more things we can look at. The trees that jump out of the ground in the Darkroot Garden are waiting in a fairly normal standing position, with just the tops of their heads sticking out. The same goes for the rockworms, there's nothing interesting to see there. The mimics, on the other hand, are a weird sort of monstrosity where it's kind of just their upper torso buried underground. Their legs have to sort of unfold and grow, which we'll get to see with the map disabled. I'll also slow down their animation a bit for good measure. And let's take a look at the undead dragon in the Painted World. I find this one interesting because it's the only opportunity to almost see one of these in their entirety. The one in the Valley of Drakes is only the upper torso, of course, and then you have all the dragon butts of Lost Isleth, which are the undead dragon's lower torso. So we can briefly see one together, but the only problem is we don't get a good view before the upper half of its body detaches and charges at us. So here's a look at the whole creature from the side. When it starts moving, a wing falls off. I always thought that was kind of an odd thing to happen, and here we can get a closer look at it. We can also see the giant skeleton in the catacombs, the one that drops through the ceiling near the Dark Moon Seance Ring, before it drops down. He has his own little room up here. One detail I never previously noticed in here was how this room has some windows that look back out into the level. I couldn't remember seeing anything like that from the other side, so I wondered if these were going to be fake one-way windows that would actually be hidden behind a wall of rock somewhere. As it turns out, no, they're actually there. It's just easy to miss because of how out of the way it is. Here's another look back at that area from over by Vamos. Lastly, let's take a look at the first encounter with Seath. Disabling the map reveals a good chunk of terrain that remains surrounding Seath. This is because all these crystals are one large object file, which makes sense, it's how the room clears out when we return. They didn't have to change the map at all, they just remove this object. Derendering the object reveals just Seath's body, which shows us that the tentacles are pushed straight back to keep them out of the way. So aside from a few things I'm saving for a deeper dive later in the video, I want to run down the rest of the things that don't warrant too much analysis or speculation. It's widely recognized that looking up above the parish church will reveal chains that extend into the sky, at least from certain angles. 
This should have something to do with how the chains for the elevator are stored or animated, and they unfortunately forgot to toggle their rendering off from this perspective. But did you know that the same thing exists out of bounds for the Blighttown elevator? You can find an extension of the ropes nearby. The same should likely apply to any elevator using ropes or chains. There's probably also no way to see this one without cheating, but the elevator to New Londa Ruins starts clipping up through Firelink the moment the lighting changes. Walking back up the stairs updates the environment so you can't see it, of course, but teleporting does the trick. In the catacombs, there are some map pieces below the room before the first bonfire. There's a set of candles down there, and also some of those nooks that carry those corpses, uh, which are apparently called loculi. But before taking a closer look at the candles, perhaps it would be a good time to mention how difficult it is to find some of the stuff. Not all Out of Bounds content simply allows clipping through the map and finding it right where it is. Sometimes you have pieces of map or objects that only render from a corresponding map piece that isn't nearest to where they actually are. Stepping into this room makes these disappear, so simply dropping through the floor wouldn't allow you to see them. Okay, so my explanation for the candles. There happens to be a spot near the last lever that has the visual effect for a flame sitting in it, but no candle attached to it. So I believe those out-of-bound candles were likely meant to go with this candleless flame here. And this isn't the only stuff out-of-bounds nearby. There's also a duplicate of the anvil used by Vamos. It's directly above this hallway here. But once again, this only renders when you're all the way down by Vamos, so to see it, you either have to teleport up to it without colliding with pieces of the map that are closer, or perhaps you could stay put and just bring the object closer to you. Another example is some dirt that can be found floating in the sky of the catacombs. You can't see it under normal circumstances, but it pops into existence when you're near the Titanite demon. Those patches of dirt belong to a map piece that bring detail to this area, like dirt and coffins. I talked about the stream found below the entrance to Sense Fortress and its surprising speculative connection to the waterfall of the catacombs, but I didn't follow it further back through to its source. Following it out of bounds reveals a bigger segment where it gets wider, which is kind of odd to see. I also showed a little bit of the low-quality Anorlando Lod, as seen from the Duke's archives, but missed something that was recently pointed out to me. It appears that the rooftops of the buildings at the entrance to Anorlando were fitted with large cannons, or like, railguns, of some kind. I'll talk a bit more about how the Lods sometimes reflect earlier designs in a moment, um, but for now, it's interesting to consider how these rooftops once had massive weapons on top. Earlier, I talked about how the unreachable cells in the Duke's archives are some of the only examples of complete, unused rooms that have working collision. But here's another one from the Demon Ruins. There's a completely inconspicuous segment of wall down here that doesn't show any obvious seams or markers. But here's another look again with prism stones marking the width of the path. Clipping through the wall reveals a short empty cave, and turning around allows us to see back through to the main path. There's apparently an unused item corpse associated with this room, so the speculation about it, as I've been told, is that perhaps a rockworm was meant to break through here and attack, and you would perhaps be able to find an item behind it as your reward. While we're in the area, it's not exactly out of bounds content, but there are some massive demonic statues surrounding the entrance to the Bed of Chaos. I think they're easy to overlook, despite being so huge. It's kind of weird. They're animated, but they're not true enemies, they're just object files. What is out of bounds, though, is what's further back behind this temple. There are a few more normal-sized demonic statues just floating in the distance. These are also just object files. Let's take a look at a few things around the Undead Parish. There's a weird segment of wall that could be found hiding out of bounds. It's underneath the area with the boar. On the underside of the bridge leading to the parish, you have this doorway by the shortcut to the bonfire. On the opposite end of the room, if you look closely at how the floor intersects the wall, you'll notice a segment that looks different from the rest. Going out of bounds to the other side reveals an unused doorway that we can see through, due to the proper texture not being included from this side. If we bump into its collision, we can update the game's visuals to render as if we were from earlier in the Undead Burg. This time it does show it properly closed off, but now a frame to the doorway has been added. 
It doesn't seem to lead anywhere in particular, but maybe they considered putting an item out here. Here's a mock-up of what that might have looked like. There's also an extra segment of floor just underneath the floor near Andre, which is a bit odd. We can also see some weird stuff over here, but that's not actually out of bounds content. These are quite possibly the worst graphics in the game if you stop to look at them. It's a simple sheet meant to represent, like, a canopy of trees. It's meant to obscure your view below when you're cliffside here in the Darkroot Garden. Passing underneath the Moonlight Butterflies arena, turning around and looking down even reveals the edge of this ultra-low-res canopy. I can turn it on and off to help show it better. What's improved by blocking our view? I have no idea, and I wonder if leaving this in was a mistake. Sure, the trees don't look great either, but being able to see the actual ground below is just a little less confusing, and certainly doesn't look worse. We can find the reason for it by entering the boss fight, though. Toggling it off reveals that the lower area isn't rendered from up here, so they just kind of put this in to have something there instead of an empty void. But still, they could have only included it to be seen from up here instead of also down there. That would have made a lot more sense. In the Demon Ruins, there's the Dormant Centipede Demon that you can see before the fight begins. Though directly above it, far above the level and out of bounds, there's another object of the Centipede Demon. This one is in a T-pose shape. Here it is again, being brought straight down to compare it to the other object. So something really weird happened when recording this part of the video. If we turn around, we can take a look at the rock worm, and I could talk about how they have this sort of superficial rock texture that is normally placed against the wall to make the burrowing effect more believable. But I didn't pull this forward for demonstrative purposes, this just happened. On its own. To most viewers, this probably doesn't seem so strange, as you've been watching me poke around at this game in weird ways for a half hour now, but trust me when I say this doesn't make any sense and I really can't think of a good explanation as to how I could have caused this, even by accident. Okay, moving on. I've also seen people talk about these weird, tall spires found in the Royal Wood. These are actually just really unfortunate, low-quality lods of some trees. If we head over there with gravity disabled to avoid updating the map, we can see that they're meant to be the large trees that surround the exit from Elizabeth's Sanctuary. I think this is a situation where either doing more or less would have been preferable. With more detail and more surrounding scenery, like the rest of the trees that are supposed to be out there, it would have been easier to understand what it was. But without them, it would have been better to remove these two trees as well. Earlier in this video, I did mention that I was going to be doing a little bit of talking about the spatial relationships between areas, as a follow-up to my Lordran's layout video. There are a few places where Out of Bounds content draw me back to this topic. Let's start with the Firelink Shrine. In the last video, I pointed out how the low-quality LOD of Firelink, which loads from a few distant areas, doesn't include the Aqueduct Tunnel, but instead includes some weird bridge, or maybe relocated tunnel, that's moved to extend from where the bonfire is. As it turns out, it's not the Aqueduct Tunnel, but an actual alternate walkway altogether. But where would this walkway have gone? This is where Out of Bounds content collides with cut content, and the result is pretty interesting. I apologize in advance if I'm forgetting anyone who helped bring this to my attention, since I think more than one person may have. Uh, I'm just a bit fuzzy on the earliest things I heard about this. But I do recall that Jester Patches pointed out to me how this segment of wall in the Lower Undead Burg has a weird property to it, which apparently he learned from Twitch streamer Miltriven. Unlike other walls nearby, attacks bounce off of it without making that metallic clinking sound nor making a spark. And this also happens to mark the location of an unused path. Teleporting nearby, out of bounds, doesn't show us anything immediately behind the wall, but looking just a little bit further finds us a path that leads to an empty doorway. Moving far enough straight ahead and clumsily interacting with some collision reveals that we were pointed back in the direction of Firelink Shrine. So this is where that weird LOD walkway comes back into the picture. Dropoff then found unused meshes for this path that he then restored, and I think with a bit of additional texture modding, he was able to reinsert it into the game. It 
It's not just a bridge extending from Firelink Shrine, but there's a room and connecting path and set of tunnels that lead us back to that location in the Lower Burg. If you want to experience this yourself, Dropoff made it available on Nexus Mods. There was quite the reaction to this, including speculation on why it was cut. Redditor Underbark pointed out how unnecessary of a shortcut it would be, putting too much importance on a random, unremarkable corridor we don't need to visit often. Why give this area a direct connection to Firelink Shrine, after all? That's a great point based on the current layout of the game, but what if it wasn't meant to actually be a shortcut at all? There's any number of reasons as to why the true Aqueduct Tunnel isn't included in the lot of Firelink Shrine, but let's consider the possibility that these two paths were mutually exclusive. If the Aqueduct didn't exist at all, what would Dark Souls have looked like if we were meant to fight our way up to the Undead Burg from the Lower Undead Burg first? Let's hold that thought as we look at something in the depths. The group of rats that everyone farms near the bonfire are below an inaccessible corridor. Teleporting up there and walking around the corner reveals whatever this is. It's a unique set piece that looks like an unused entrance. At least it feels like a major entrance or exit due to its size. There's also a few bits of odd terrain nearby as well. Now geographically, where does this put us? Let's mark this area by dropping a bunch of prism stones. Though there's no collision here, the roof of the gaping dragon's room is nearby below, which will be a good enough reference for where this is. Back up near the entrance to the depths, there's this corpse item in this dead end. Let's teleport to the other side of this gate and follow the out-of-bounds path. We can see that it's pointed very near to this unused entrance. Then there's also this. Hiding in the ceiling of the first main room with the butcher is a weird set of boards. It's a unique object that isn't used elsewhere, and it's breakable. And the unreachable platform beneath it does have collision. Is this maybe another unused point of entry? Could we have fallen through the roof and then dropped down from here? Its location is somewhere near the base of this tower. Even the collision map shows a hole in the roof. Maybe I'm reading into a random set of breakable boards too much, but combined with the weird entrance to the depths and the cut pathway to the lower undead burg, it's not unreasonable to speculate that alternate entrances to the depths were being considered earlier in development. And maybe if this was meant to be the main path from Firelink Shrine, perhaps the choice would be made from here, whether to go up through the Lower Undead Burg towards the first Bell of Awakening, or down through the depths to the second Bell of Awakening. And wait, that's actually not all. While editing this episode, I found a couple more things using Dark Souls Map Viewer. To the right of the first butcher, behind the wall, there is an unused room of some kind. And further beneath the map, we can find what appears to be a duplicate of the entrance to the depths. These additional odds and ends help reinforce the idea that the depths layout was being experimented with. Okay, so let's return to the idea that Firelink might have connected to the early game differently. Do we have any direct evidence of a different layout for the Undead Burg that wouldn't have connected to Firelink via the Aqueduct Tunnel? Not exactly, again this is all just speculation based on these bits of unused content, but we do have a partial look at an early Undead Burg. It's different, but inconclusive. But you do actually see a little bit of it in-game. Ever notice that weird scaffolding off in the distance? You could always assume it's along the outer walls in a way that we don't get to see up close, but there's one problem with that. You can poke your head around the corner and not see any of that. It also doesn't show from some other perspectives as well. Now you may be thinking, we weren't expected to look around the corner or down over these edges, which is probably true but I do believe these are still leftovers from an earlier design. There's some scaffolding or a walkway of some kind, and some buildings that jut out, rather than the flat wall that actually exists. But much more interesting is this structure up top. Look familiar? It's the path to the bonfire. Only, it's a building with a roof, and the bridge to the bonfire isn't in sight. At the bottom of the stairs, instead of a closed railing, is some more scaffolding. This alone doesn't tell us how the Undead Burg may or may not have connected to Firelink Shrine, but combined with the other observations, it is interesting. We can also take a look at early footage from trailers to see if they offer further insight. The second Dark Souls trailer shows the Hellkite Drake resting on the Aqueduct Tunnel. 
Though maybe this disagrees with my hypothesis at first glance, seeing that perhaps the tunnel was there from early on, it also raises more questions. Maybe the tunnel was going to be there, but the Hellkite might have been there to kill anyone approaching with fire, which could have still funneled players in this direction. We also see a ladder down here at the end, which of course didn't make it into the final game. In the first official Dark Souls trailer, we can also get a very brief look at the early Undead Burg. It includes a roof over the platform near the bonfire, just like we saw in the LOD a few moments ago. It does seem to include the path to the bonfire here, which we didn't see in the LOD, so I'd be curious if this state of the game also had all that scaffolding as well. So we also have the kiln. I glossed over the kiln's placement in the Lordran's layout video due to being a disconnected map with a cutscene that separates it. To elaborate on that further, if we follow the obvious interpretation that it must be below Firelink Shrine, since we can drop straight down there without Frampt, it still has that white, heavenly corridor and a large open sky above it. It's kind of a magical space and it feels like it's placed without particular consideration to other maps. So there's nothing really to clarify when talking about where it belongs in the world. But I saved talking about the kiln for this video because we have this hiding behind the walls. It appears to be an unused cave-like entrance to the kiln. If we load the Firelink Shrine, then teleport to the same coordinates to see where this entrance would be, we find that we're not actually perfectly below Firelink, and we're also not as far down as we would expect. We're sort of behind the Firelink Graveyard. And nearby, we can see that weird cylindrical structure in the Firelink Shrine. So, this structure has nothing hiding inside if we clip into it, but if we consider its location, it is directly behind this statue in the Firelink Shrine. With a nearby piece of map disabled, we can get a better look at the statue's proximity to that structure. There's concept art of Andre pushing a statue aside, and what may be a cave-like descending path behind it. This was even talked about in an interview from the Design Works book. We had talked about Andre being King Gwyn's descendant at first. It's like he would protect the gate within Firelink Shrine and ultimately open it. He'd slide away the shrine's goddess statue. It was that, but he became just a blacksmith before we knew it. There's some remaining evidence of this in-game, in the form of an unused cutscene where the Firelink statue does slide out of the way. So my guess is that this structure was originally intended to house a descending path, perhaps something like a spiral staircase followed by a tunnel, that would take us into the kiln. We might be able to corroborate this a little further. When we visit the Lod Firelink, it has this structure a little bit misplaced. Instead of being where behind the statue is, it's on the right, meaning it's placed where you meet Petrus. And because that area is no longer there, we see that the area around it is designed differently to match this. There's a much more narrow corridor and a walkway that would take you up to the Undead Parish elevator. Now it's hard to be certain of what's intentional, given that we're not meant to go up here and there is a lot of nearby terrain that isn't included in the LOD. But the area around here is fairly complete, and where the statue is in the final game has a solid wall behind it. But if we turn right, we see a hole in the wall, and that takes us into the cylindrical structure. Given how the alternate bridge seen in the LOD did turn out to reflect content from an earlier design, I think this means the statue would have been here on the right originally. There's also another LOD of Firelink Shrine that gets rendered from the Undead Burg. This one doesn't include the cylindrical structure itself, but it does have a hole in the ground directly below where it should be based on the other LOD. It could be a weird coincidence, or it could be indicative of a descending path that would have been underneath. One last thing we can look at, we can see navigation meshes visualized. I only have a very surface level understanding of them, but it relates to how the game understands how to navigate the environment, particularly in regards to enemy pathing. So they basically blanket all traversable parts of the maps. In Dark Souls, it even connects areas that are only reached by teleporting, so here at the entrance of Anorlando, we can see a nav mesh that links back down to Sen's Fortress. With a few ways to teleport into the kiln, it's no surprise that we find those kinds of nav meshes down there as well. The one traveling down in this direction is how the game sends you up here through Kath from the Abyss. The other one is the one that connects to Firelink Shrine. 
But if we take a closer look in Dark Souls Map Studio, we can see how that nav mesh is aligned perfectly with the unused cave entrance. It's quite a bit lower, but the fact that it passes directly underneath caught my attention. And if we follow it back up, we find it leading directly to a duplicate of the statue from Firelink Shrine. I think this gives us further evidence of the cave entrance being a legitimate former entrance, then it was likely altered slightly and adjusted to work, for dropping into Framp's pit instead. Here's also a quick look at something we can find in the Painted World. The tower at the end of the level has some leftover evidence of a previous design. Running around the upper part of the tower with gravity disabled allows us to hit some collision that walks us upwards, like an invisible staircase. Going underneath the floor and re-enabling gravity also allows us to land on some hidden collision. Using the collision map viewer, we can see that there are actually staircases that remain invisible in-game. There's also a variety of unused objects that reveal breakable floors that could have belonged here. The Painted World was one of the first areas designed in Dark Souls as a sort of test or prototype level, so it makes sense that they wouldn't know how it might connect back to the map at first, before they settled on it being a completely disconnected map. So I believe the original consideration wasn't just jumping off the platform and teleporting to another level, but instead perhaps defeating a boss, breaking the floor, and then descending down the tower. Closer look in Dark Souls Map Studio backs this up further. We find an unused asylum demon placed above Priscilla, with that sort of cut-out, breakable floor underneath it. And one last thing we can see in the painted world, there's an unused cutscene for a different way to leave the level. Now that we've basically wrapped up actual Out of Bounds content to discuss, we might as well pivot back to breaking down the relationships between areas. To start with, I'd like to include what I felt like was the biggest thing missing from Lorjan's layout. That is, the relationship between the Depths and Blighttown. The overall relationship is pretty straightforward. You descend from the Depths into Blighttown in a way that's pretty easy to understand. There's a few things we could clarify, like where does the Gaping Dragon crawl out from? The vertical shaft does clip into the Blighttown map a little bit in a couple places, so there's not a totally clear answer, but I think there are two possibilities. If we go all the way to the left and hug the corner, and also lose our bloodstain down there, we can use the bloodstain trick to reveal that it puts us in that sort of central shaft. It's a wide space that extends vertically with no obvious ceiling to it, and at the very bottom of it, there's that chest with the dragon scale in it. Given how the locations essentially match in placement, and how thematically relevant the dragon scale is, this is the most likely answer. We can imagine that the Gaping Dragon scaled this structure up into the depths. But we also have an alternative if a few of the inconsistencies are bothering you. We don't see any running water, and there's a lot of enemies down here who would likely stay clear of the Gaping Dragon. And remember that I said that you have to go to the far corner of that pit to make things line up. The majority of this pit doesn't line up, and instead puts you somewhere out of bounds in Blighttown. It would put you somewhere on the opposite side of this gated area that we see from the central shaft. And if we move on over to where all the blow dart snipers are, there's also a gated path pointing to the same general area. So that's our alternative to the Gaping Dragon being in that main central column. Its den could simply be an unseen area, perhaps another vertical shaft that runs parallel to it. Apart from that, what's interesting about the relationship between these two areas is less in the specific placement of the maps, and more in their thematic relationship. We have the Gaping Dragon climb up from near where the dragon scale is, but that's not all. Let's consider the Parasitic Wallhugger. I don't think it's just hanging out in that random spot for fun. Rather, the developers purposefully placed it at the end of a ramp to imply that it's feeding on runoff from the depths. There's also the infested barbarians who drop dung pies. Being the only enemies to drop literal fecal waste is probably not a random design choice, but is likely based on the fact that they reside in a shantytown that's below the depths. The dung pies can be interpreted to be waste that made its way down to Blighttown through the sewage system. It also explains the poisonous pool at the bottom of Blighttown. This is where the sewage ultimately collects and stagnates. 
One thing that I hadn't considered on my own, and that was pointed out to me, was how the rock throwing barbarians can drop the pickaxe. It seems like a bit of a random drop given how they don't use one. But remember how the back entrance to Blight Town doesn't appear to be entirely natural. There's some platforms and support beams found throughout the cave, which implies that it might have been excavated at some point. So the rock throwers drop the pickaxes they once used, and the boulders are likely their stockpile of excavated rock, I suppose. One more thing worth taking a look at is the collapsed walkway in the Valley of Drakes. In the previous video, I showed how Ulisil was Darkroot in the past, and how even the Abyss where you find the Four Kings was not far from the Abyss where you find Manus. To further clarify this point, I want to talk about how I believe this collapsed walkway would have originally led into Ulisil. There's nothing obvious behind it, and it doesn't neatly connect with any specific location, but the Chasm of the Abyss is back there. Here's a look in Kyan's Map Explorer, the one map viewer to correct the location of the DLC to properly overlap it with the Darkroot map. I believe the proximity between the two areas is not a coincidence. You have Ulisil, which fell to the Abyss, and New Londo, which also eventually fell to the Abyss. So, the connecting bridge in the Valley of Drakes? I interpret it to be like a former, significant pathway between the two cities. If the proximity to the Chasm of the Abyss isn't enough to convince you, remember that the elevator on the immediate other side of this doorway takes you up to Darkroot, which was Ulisil in the past. So it's hard to see this collapsed path as anything other than a connection to Ulisil. This also calls into question the purpose of these massive doorways, so time for more environmental lore speculation. They presumably weren't flooding something on the other side of this one, so it becoming a floodgate for New London Ruins seems more like something that was decided after the fact. Plus, I don't think the citizens of New Londo would have been carrying on as normal if it was obvious a giant barrier meant to flood them was being constructed. What kind of threat would warrant such a strong defense? Perhaps these doors were meant to keep the Abyss out in the first place. With the road pointing in the direction of Ulisil, it's believable at some point that New Londo would have learned of strange things happening there. The townsfolk started going mad, and things only got worse until New Londo decided to quarantine themselves from Ulisil. Having two sets of doors might have not even been a mutual decision, it could have been them trying to keep Ulisil at bay as it erupted into chaos. The very door meant to protect them from the Abyss became a death trap for the townsfolk, a more drastic way to try and stop the Abyss using the same construction. We also have a reasonable explanation for this pathway collapsing as well. A lot of things in the area were caving in, and some of that probably just wound up down here. So I swear that lore speculation isn't usually my thing, I'm more of a mechanics guy, but I figure I might as well embrace it at the moment given the direction this video has gone in. So allow me to recreate for you how an extra coffin in Nito's lair sent me down a chain of somewhat tenuous connections that wound up giving me a better understanding of Pinwheel. A lot of the common lore speculation surrounding Pinwheel portrays them as a tragic figure, an entity trying to rebuild its family. We have the family masks, and concept art reveals that it's actually three bodies crammed together behind those masks. Some also believe Pinwheel's theme to have audio of a man whispering, I'm so sorry, repeatedly, further strengthening the idea that Pinwheel regrets hurting or not saving his family and wanting to bring them back. But I don't know that I buy that. Every time there's ambient whispering in Souls games, people want to look for hidden messages, and I think Pareidolia kicks in. It's really not clear at all that that's being spoken in Pinwheel's theme. I have a different interpretation of Pinwheel. Instead of being a tragic figure, they're more like… a really creepy and relentless cultist. They're obsessed with Nido. Pinwheel's described as a necromancer who stole the power of the Gravelord and took over the catacombs. Are they using that power to rebuild their family? I think instead, they want to use that power to become Nido. So back to the coffins. I never really understood the smaller coffin next to Nido. Nido's lore is next to non-existent. All we know is that he's first of the dead. He's a ball of skeletons. Uh, there's something about death and disease and perhaps proliferating bane. But it's not like we know Nido to have a partner or a second in command. There's basically nothing to go on. But I did eventually notice something that eluded me for a while. There's another coffin in here. It's right here. Can you see it? Here's another look from Out of Bounds. This coffin is actually built into the environment as a fixed piece of map. It's not an object we can easily pull and move around with debug, so this is our best look at it for now. So we have a third, smaller coffin. That makes me wonder, did Nito have a family? 
Is that what these extra coffins indicate? The catacombs were full of statues that idolize a family, and if we understand Pinwheel as someone who has invaded and taken over, perhaps these statues predate their reign. Perhaps the family masks, which match the faces of the worn down statues, are tributes to Nito's family. The father is described as Valiant, a fitting adjective for someone who fought alongside Gwyn to defeat immortal dragons. But why would Pinwheel respect or revere someone they want to dethrone? I think it's because they don't just want Nito's power, they want to closely emulate their idol as much as possible. The table in Pinwheel's room, whatever Pinwheel is working on when we first find them, it has a skeleton on it with missing hands, and there's a curved blade underneath right where its right hand should be. It's not a dead ringer for the Gravelord sword, and maybe it's just a coincidence, but the general look is giving me some serious Nito vibes. Also, how would we describe Nito? He's a ball of skeletons cloaked in a black aura. What is Pinwheel? They're a pile of bodies cloaked in a… black… cloak. It's this weird series of tangents I went down that had me see Pinwheel as a copycat cultist of sorts. Throwing bodies together under a black robe is certainly less elegant than Nito, almost like a bad cosplay. And their idolization of Nito results in a more ceremonial or religious kind of look, explaining how we arrive at this. I can't say that my speculation is better than anyone else's, but it was inspired by Out of Bounds exploration. So that wraps things up. I hope you found it interesting, and if you came here just to see things that were out of bounds, I hope all the tangents were bearable. Did I miss anything? Or is there anything in Dark Souls you wish you could get a better look at? Please let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for watching.